Greetings, church family. In Jesus' name, it's a joy to be here. You've just seen a real illustration of how much we need each other, huh? There's a few of you that were wished happy birthday two weeks in a row, and whoever's birthday was last week, why, you got missed, because I had the wrong week uh, last Sunday when I said happy birthday. So um, you just have to have grace with us. Like, uh, we mess up like that. And, uh, and Jake, uh, Justin and I were having a little conversation there, and he understood it, but I didn't understand it. I did, but I forgot it or something. And it's just uh, amazing to me how God shows us through little things like this of how much we need each other. And here's what's amazing, that if trust is healthy and relationships are healthy, then those little things are just little things. But anytime there is stress and strain and some uh, things uh, that are dysfunctional in relationships, those little things end up becoming big things because we see things in those little things that were never meant and uh, have a misunderstanding about how it all came about, then, wow, can we make life difficult for ourselves. So the title of uh, my message this morning is The Person and the Work of the Holy Spirit. The Person and the Work of the Holy Spirit. This is a subject that I would uh, love to continue after my message, and uh, I hope to stimulate some conversation in our group here. This, I'm a student of the Holy Spirit, understanding the person and work of the Holy Spirit. What does he do? What does it mean? And how is the Holy Spirit so important and essential to our Christian lives? And is it actually possible to live as a kingdom man or woman without the Holy Spirit? Can you follow Jesus without the Holy Spirit? And I think it would probably depend on who you would ask that question to. Uh, what does it mean? What does it look like when the, we, we hear this amongst ourselves? Where sometimes we hear the comment, we say that God showed up. What are we articulating? What's happening when we say uh, God showed up? God's always present everywhere, right? But there's something significant that happens when we sense the presence of God in a real way and our hearts open up and we feel cared for, we feel ministered to, we feel something flowing from the courts of heaven into our hearts. And we assume, and if you're like I am, you kind of assume that, yeah, we kind of know what the Holy Spirit is, what He does, how He works, but it's a hard thing to wrestle with because... Well, the Holy Spirit's kind of like wind, you know. You can't see Him physically. You can see what He does. You can see where He goes by people responding. But then how do you know if it's Jesus? How do you know if it's the Christ? Or how do you know it's your Heavenly Father? And like, how does this all work together? So that's where I want to go this morning. And... I want us to, uh, my goal is that when we get through the message that we understand how important the Holy Spirit is and in our hearts there's everything within us that is longing for a filling, for an anointing, and for knowing this Holy Spirit in a much deeper, greater way than what we envision or have right now. You simply cannot grow and develop and become everything that God has asked you to be in your Christian walk with Him without the Holy Spirit. Is He a person? If He is, why don't we pray to Him more? How often do you pray in your private prayers or in our public prayers? How often do we actually pray to the Holy Spirit? Why or why not? Would that make you feel uncomfortable? You know, you hear uh, reference made to the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's, a, it's an influence or it's a force or it's something that's powerful. But I don't think that's the truth. I think he's an actual person. And as we get into the scriptures this morning, why I just want us to marvel at what God has provided through the Holy Spirit and open ourselves up and seek and pursue the filling and the anointing of this amazing gift that came through um, 
what Jesus offered when he opened up all of heaven's resources for us. John 7, 39. Turn with me there. This is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. And he's saying something here that is hard for his audience to follow. John 7, 37. In that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, it's not unusual for us to read this and marvel at the authenticity of that statement and know that that statement is to be true and believe it, but we uh, sh stop short of the next uh, verse here. Notice what the next verse says here. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now Jesus makes it very clear here. This rivers of living water that he envisioned that it's going to flow from our belly, flow out. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. So my question to you is this morning, have you had the work of the Spirit done in your heart, in your life? Do you know what it's like to have this river of water flowing out of you? Hmm. Do I know what that's like? Am I a little bit like uh, this man that the highway department hired? They hired a new painter to paint the lines on the road. The first day on the job, he painted a five-mile stretch of road, and he was the talk of the whole department. They were just amazed at how productive he was. The next day, he did well again, but this time only two and a half miles. Still very good. On the third day, he painted one and a quarter mile of road, and his results were not nearly as impressive. On the fourth day, only three quarters of a mile of the road was painted. By now, there was concern at his drop of performance, so his boss called him in to find out why the decline in output. When he was asked about why he only painted half as much as the day before, he openly told them the reason. He said, as I kept painting, I go further and further away from the bucket of paint. Somehow he didn't make the connection that he could actually move the bucket of paint with him as he paints. I'm asking the question, is that sometimes a little bit like it's like our new birth experience? Right when we're born again, the freshness of what happened, the freshness of the condemnation and the guilt and everything that we felt and the weight of sin and everything that God brought to us and we're so excited and we get started and we're painting this road and wow, we put the other Christians to shame with our enthusiasm sometimes, don't we? And then as time goes on, we find out that maybe we get a little further and further away from the source. Why is that? So I have a question I'd like to ask you. Go to Mark with me. Mark chapter 1. And notice John's message in Mark chapter 1, verse 3, starting. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Okay, you tell me, what did John do? It's simple, it's right there, tell me. He baptized and preached for what? Uh huh, the remission of sins. And he baptized. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Isn't that what we do today? We feel the weight of sin. We need something to do with our sin. So we preach repentance and the remission of sins and baptism. 
But do you see something here? If I go to all four Gospels, and I double-check this just to make sure, it seems like this particular point is really important because all four Gospels say the same thing in a different way. That John came and baptized with the baptism for the remission of sins. I think as these people came and confessed their sins, as they showed their sins, and they went into the Jordan River and were baptized, I think they found some incredible release from the condemnation and the guilt that they felt. Something significant was happening there. They were saying, I need something. They were recognizing there's something wrong with me. They were recognizing their humanity. But notice what John goes on to say. And John was clothed, oh, sorry, continuing on in verse 5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed, what you experienced here is a work of God. I baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now who is he talking about here? Who's the he? Yes, right. And in all four Gospels, John is very clear in his preaching and teaching that we are baptizing you for the remission of sins, but there's one coming after me. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now I have a question to ask. Is it possible today to preach the gospel for the remission of sins, to take care of the sin problem, to be cleansed, through water baptism, but miss the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is that possible? Can that happen? I'd like for you to uh, explore the answer to that question as we get into the message. I think the scripture will speak for itself. But here for these people, they experience something significantly, something significant spiritually. They were baptized. They experienced the remission of sins. They experienced repentance. They experienced confession. But yet, John says, there's one thing that's missing. <clears throat> this statement doesn't come from me, but I want you to listen to me as I read it. I just thought it illustrates uh, some of what I'm trying to communicate this morning. Oh, how Christianity in the 20th century has suffered by making the goal of salvation to be escape from hell and going to heaven. Now, beloved, these are certainly grand benefits, and I won't minimize them for a moment, but it is just as reasonable to think that the whole of our delight should be an escape from punishment and our home in heaven as it is to think that a young bride finds her delight in the fact that she won't have to go to the office anymore and endure the punishment that the work entails, and she's going to have a home that somebody else pays for. So here you have a young lady that's working, and she's having to work hard to provide for herself, and here comes an amazing young man and asks for her hand, and he courts her, and he marries her, and the thing that she is the most excited about is, I don't have to work anymore. He's going to give me a house, he's going to give me food, he's going to give me shelter, and wow, all my physical needs are met. And that's where her focus is, that's all she can think. And do you see something wrong with that picture? How do you think the husband's going to feel about this after they're married a few weeks and he's wondering where the shazaz of their marriage went? I mean, after they're married a, a while, somehow the romance, the spark, the love that's supposed to be there, it's just missing. He married her because he loved her. Of course, there's some benefits from that, but he didn't marry her for the benefits. She married him because of the benefits. It's a crude illustration of what a relationship's going to be like with God. When we want forgiveness for our sins, we want a way to go to heaven, and then we just kind of want to be left alone.
No, my friend, it isn't just to take you where he is, but to come where you are so that heaven could begin in your heart and you could be filled with the fullness of God. And thus everything in this glorious salvation is to the end that he would walk in you and dwell in you and you will be his temple, his dwelling place, and you could be filled with all the fullness of God. And in this state, God would be satisfied and you would be complete. The world would be blessed and heaven would rejoice. And anything less than this robs us of all the grand benefits. Turn with me to John 14 as the disciples are trying to understand, just like we try to understand this mysterious thing called the Holy Spirit. Who is he? What does he do? How does he work? How can I know him? And they're wrestling with all of these questions. And in the end of John here, right before Jesus is betrayed, he's having some final conversations with the disciples, and he's opening up, if you will, the curtains of heaven and allowing them to peek behind a bit in John 14, 15, 16, and 17. And he says some things here that I want us to lean into and try to understand what is Jesus talking about here. Now, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you and go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, and the whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. So here he's preparing the disciples for some tough waters ahead. And he's trying to tell them before it happens that he's actually leaving. And they're trying to understand what Jesus is talking about here. What do you mean you're leaving? Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Just a reasonable question, a request there. Jesus said, Have I been so long with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? For he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? In other words, the Father and I are one. <laughs> If you see me, you know me, you know the Father. I come from the Father. Believest now, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So now he here is emphasizing how him and the Father are distinct and separate, yet they're one and the same. The mystery of all that, ah, it's hard for me to come up with the language to articulate. But that's what it says here in plain English. Now go on and read me with, with me as he brings the third part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit into this. In verse 12, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's back this up now. So I'm leaving. The Father and I are one. I'm going to the Father. And now, you all that are left here, you're not going with me, I'm actually leaving you, you're going to do greater works than you've seen me do for the last three years. All the things that you've seen in me proclaiming the kingdom, what that looks like, what that feels like, all the miracles that happened, all the uh, deliverances that were had, Jesus looks at them and says, you're going to do something greater than me. How is that possible? Especially since he's leaving. They're trying to understand this. It's a mystery to them. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. And they're trying to understand, Jesus, what are you saying? Right now we can just ask you. We can see you physically. You're right there. We've walked with you. 
We understand your humanity. We have seen the signs of your humanity all over you. We have seen you weep. We've seen you bleed. We've seen you get hungry. We've seen you get tired. But now you're saying you're leaving? If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Wait a minute. What? I'm leaving and sending someone else. That's what he's saying here. And then he goes on to say, talking about this comforter, and the thing that you notice here is that Jesus' physical presence was temporal. When Jesus was in Jerusalem and they were in Bethany, they were not at the same place. When Jesus was outside and he went on a little further and he went to pray and he's over there and they're back here, they're not at the same place. And one of the first things you notice that Jesus says about the Holy Spirit here and this comforter, he says, he may abide with you forever. There's something about that address that changed, something about the presence that changed from what they'd experienced up till now. Even, he goes on to say, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. He's talking about his crucifixion that is just fixing to happen in the next day or two. But ye shall see me because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now they're trying to understand this. Somehow whatever Jesus is talking about here is taking us to a gr way greater, grander place and experience than what we've experienced up till now, but he's not physically going to be present. Like, how is this all supposed to happen? Let's skip down to verse 26. Uh, verse 25, These things have I yet spoken unto you, being yet present with you. Physically present. He's trying to explain what's fixing to happen. But the Comforter, and then here, here Jesus expressly defines who this Comforter is, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. On over to John 15, in verse 26, at the end of this discourse of abiding in the vine, Jesus goes on to say about this comforter, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, go down to uh, chapter 16, and he keeps talking about he's leaving and somebody else is coming, and he gets specific in verse 7. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient or necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, and he goes on to say what the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit is going to do. My question for you is, why did Jesus have to leave so the Holy Spirit could come? I don't understand that. That's a deep mystery to me. But Jesus says here in verse 7, he's very clear about the fact, I'm going to leave and go to my Father, make a request to him. When I make that request, he's going to send the Spirit. The Spirit's always going to be with you, and look what he's going to do. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my Father, and here he's clear again, you're not physically going to see me anymore. After I go to the Father, I won't be around anymore. You're not going to see me. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them all. 
So how are these disciples supposed to understand all of this information overload that Jesus is giving them in the last few hours before his betrayal? Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, so he, he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. And they're just really wrestling with this thing, because Jesus keeps emphasizing that I'm leaving, I'm leaving, but somebody's coming to take my place. I don't understand, I don't understand how all this is supposed to work. I don't understand why Jesus had to leave physically and go back to the Father before the Holy Spirit could come. But here's what we do know. We go through the next few days here, and we see that these men that thought they were bold, that thought that they were wise, that thought that they had what it took to not deny and betray Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, when betrayal was on, and it looked like their very own necks might be at risk, they turned into completely different people. And then you go through the betrayal, you go through the death, you go through the burial, you go through the resurrection, and after the resurrection, they're still incredulous. They don't really know what happened. Now they know that Jesus is alive. They know that he's the Messiah. And we go to Acts now and read what... Uh, happens here in Acts, after all of this happened, now let's come back and pick up the story because here is where we see what's actually happening, what Jesus was promising in John 14, John 15, and John 16. So here, Acts starts out with uh, to Theophilus, and it specifies here that uh, Jesus was seen of the disciples and many others of infallible proofs for 40 days. And now that's coming to an end, these 40 days. And he spoke of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. But they still didn't know what this Holy Spirit was about. Like, Jesus, you said you're going to leave. You left for a few days, but you resurrected again. And now you just poof, show up in a room and you disappear. We're out fishing, and all of a sudden you're walking along the seashore, and we show up, and there's all of a sudden fish that are ready to eat, and the miracle of the fishes, all of that happened after the resurrection, and they're still trying to understand this and trying to figure out what does it mean that the Holy Spirit is going to come, and what does that look like? And being assembled together, Acts 1 verse 4, together with him, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. You see that? Isn't that incredible? This is just what, what we read in the beginning of all of the... Of the uh, Gospels, we read how John baptized with water and why he baptized with water. And after three years and some odd days, now the fruition and the truth of what John was saying is going to come to pass. Now Jesus is saying it's fixing to happen. Yes, John baptized with water. Yes, you were repented for your sins. Yes, you were forgiven of your sins. But there's something that is still missing. When therefore they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Then when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. 
which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then they went back to Jerusalem and they had this meeting and they ordained another apostle to take Judas's place and now they're just sitting there and waiting and they don't really know what they're waiting for. Jesus described the Holy Spirit He's going to be with you. He's going to be in you. He's going to fill you. He's going to teach you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to inspire you. All the things that I told you in the last three years that you should have remembered but you forgot, he's going to bring it back to your remembrance. But this thing of being filled with the Holy Spirit was so important that Jesus gave clear instructions for them to stay at Jerusalem until this happens. Up till now, what do you see? You see a bunch of scared men hiding out in a room and scared that their head is next on the chopping block. That's what you see. They believe Jesus. They believe who Jesus is. But they can't get themselves to do anything about it. And brothers and sisters, when the Holy Ghost fell down, everything changed. Everything changed. Maybe if you haven't felt the Holy Spirit move and work in your life, and you wonder what this is about, what are you trying to say, Corey? Maybe you've ex experienced a baptism unto the remission of sins, and you have confessed your sins. But where's the power? Are you too far from your paint bucket? <laughs> Why did you come to faith in Christ? Does it seem like a lot of what you thought the Christian life is going to be is locked away from you? I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this Holy Spirit filling is the key. Look at what happens here. Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came as a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then you see the transformation of these fearful men, these scared men, that didn't have wisdom and didn't know what was going on. All of a sudden, they had a spine, they had a message, they had something to say, they had people to say it to, and you couldn't keep them quiet. It changed everything for them. This is why Jesus said, stay at Jerusalem until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you go through the book of Acts, what do you see? The recipe is there, isn't it? And it's not always the same. Sometimes, while the gospel is being preached, the Holy Ghost fell. And it was so obvious, it was so clear to all, that the, the question is, well, they have the Holy Ghost, just like we did. What hinders them to be baptized? The next time, they believed on Jesus, he's the Messiah, he's the King, and they put their faith and trust in him, and then they were baptized, and then the Holy Spirit came. But the point is, the Holy Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit comes, it's not a secret. It's not a mystery. It's not a maybe. It's not I think so. It's not I want it to, but I'm not sure. It's a knowing. It grips you from the heart. It changes everything. So the question is, for you and for me, if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, why not? Why not? Do you, do I struggle with the assurance of salvation and knowing what Jesus did for me? Turn with me to Romans 8, verse 16. I think this is incredible. If you struggle with knowing where you are with God, God wants to meet with you this morning through the Holy Spirit and bring you to a place of confidence. Knowing what happened in your heart 
and having the filling of the Holy Spirit, knowing that it's Him and not you, will completely change and revolutionize your Christian walk and your Christian life. It will change everything. Look at the witness here. I just noticed this as I was preparing for this message, Romans 8, chapter, verse 16. Look at the role of the Spirit here. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So when I ask Jesus into my heart, when I confessed my sin, when I repented, my biggest question was when I was converted, how do I know that it actually happened? How can I tell? So often I think we have digressed it to an intellectual exercise and a mental exercise, and yes, you're supposed to feel peace, but brothers and sisters, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> it's not a maybe, it's not an if, it's not, I can't quite know, I don't know where I'm at. The Spirit in your heart bears witness that you are the child of God. Go to Romans, uh, sorry, uh, Hebrews 10, 15. And we're just talking about this thing of witness. And I'm just pulling out a few scriptures that talk about this. The role and the work of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10, verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before... This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and, in their, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The Holy Spirit is how Jesus takes himself, his eternal oneness that he has, and he takes the kingdom constitution, the laws and the commandments of the God of heaven, and he writes it on our hearts. It's with and through the Holy Spirit. Notice again, the Holy Spirit is a witness. 1 John 5. There's so much optimism, so much joy, so much confidence in how 1 John talks about this. In 1 John 5, verse 6, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. Isn't that incredible? I don't think that... Let me say it another way. If you're not confident, if I'm not confident of who we are in Christ, and we don't have that witness of the Holy Spirit that has anchored us to the God of heaven through the Holy Spirit, it's going to be really difficult for us to lean into all of the promises and the blessings and the work that God has called us to as his people if we don't understand this. We'll be spending so much time, we talk about identity a lot, and identity is a big deal. Do we know who we are in Christ? Do we know what Christ says about us? How do you practically, experientially know that in your heart? It is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in your heart witnesses and testifies to the great eternal realities that happened over 2,000 years ago. He makes it real and practical. It's not a, I think so, and maybe, and we hope so, and uh, we just try to drum up a little more faith. That's not what's described here. It's a knowing. But there's a filling of the Holy Spirit that connects with this kind of knowing. The Holy Spirit is also the one that fills us with spiritual power. We see this in Acts 2.8. We see this in 1 Corinthians 2.4. Paul, when he was out preaching, he said, I deliberately 
craft my message so it's not the oratorial skills I have or the fancy English words that I use or knowing all the Hebrew and the Greek and all of the different theological terms of what's happening. He says, I deliberately stay away from that, so what? So you're impressed with the power of God. So there's no question when God's at work and the Holy Spirit moves that it's God that's moving. It's not me. It's not Paul. It's not you. It's God. The Holy Spirit is a teacher, intercessor. John 16, 3 talks about being our teacher. 1 John 2, 27 talks about the Spirit interceding on our behalf. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 12, it talks about He's the revealer of the deep mysteries of God. Who knows the mind of God? Who knows the heart of God? And it says the Spirit of God does. And the Spirit of God is here to reveal to you and me in ways that we can understand and grasp and be thrilled about, be excited about, and follow in a way that He can explain it to our hearts to where we know who God is and we know what He's called us to do and how to live. In Romans 8, He talks about Intercessory prayer, the Holy Spirit interceding for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Sometimes we are in a bad way. We don't even know how to express and articulate the deep pain that's in our heart, the doubt, the anguish, the turmoil. It's there. It's pulling us down. Romans tells us the Spirit intercedes. He makes intercessory prayer. He gives spiritual gifts to us for the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 11, makes it very clear about the revelation of the Holy Spirit that He pours out in manifestation on the church. And He gives me a gift. He gives you a spiritual gift for the edification of the body. So what happens, brothers and sisters, if we kind of know, but it's not a real part of our experience. Based on the scriptures that I read with, that I just read, and on my personal experience, and some of the stories that I have read, I would say that you're a likely candidate for a doubt-filled, powerless Christianity that you simply wonder sometimes why it's not working. You don't have any gas in your engine. You got it cleaned up. But you need some gas. You need this filling. So why doesn't the filling come? What would happen here? Can you imagine what would happen if we would have the kind of hunger and desperation for this? How would it change our church life if this would become a priority for us? How would it change me in my personal life if this would become a priority? This glass, it's full of air. I need some of y'all to help me to understand science. What's the best way to get this air out of this glass? How can I get the air out? Any of you have any ideas? How can I get this air out of the glass? Huh? Ah, yeah, ah, uh -huh. he's got it. You could do a whole lot of things, right? You might be able to use vacuum seal and pull it out, but then you would collapse the glass, right? There's a lot of things that could happen. And brothers and sisters, it's, it, it's like that with the Holy Spirit in our life. I'm asking you, and you might be asking yourself, how do I get filled with the Holy Spirit? Is it something that you manufacture? Is it something that you force? The best way to get the air out of this glass is just, just fill it up. What's happening to the air? See? The air is all disappearing. I guess I drank just the right amount. And the air is gone. So what happens if you try to clean up your act, you try to get rid of the sin in your life, the things in your life that you know that God is not happy with, and you're trying so hard to be the person that God called you to be, and you're just sucking on an empty glass. That's not how it's designed to work. 
Go with me to Luke 11. And Jesus speaks to this very thing. We're asking the question, how do I get this? How can I have this kind of meaning and purpose? The joy and the excitement. This rivers of living water. Listen, Luke 11, starting in verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble be not, the door is now shut, my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. So I'm laying in bed, it's one o'clock in the morning, and Carl shows up, and he says, I had some visitors come from Illinois, and I'm embarrassed, but my uh, pantry's completely empty, and I have to have something for breakfast, I need you to get up and give me something. I'm like, Carl, go to bed. No, I'm sleeping. The children are all in bed. My feet are all washed. It's been really cozy in here. And this is a very rude awakening. Carl just won't go away. He stays there. And you need to understand, in the context that Jesus is talking about here in the Middle East, hospitality is everything. Your character, your reputation hangs around your hospitality. Hospitality is such a big thing over there that even if you're an enemy, a sworn enemy, if you step across the threshold and you're in somebody's house, then they will not kill you while they're giving you hospitality. That's how strong the culture of hospitality is. This is what Jesus is talking about here. So what am I supposed to tell Carl? I tell him, go down to Dollar General. Well, he says it's closed. I say, deal with it. You have to take the embarrassment, not me. Carl says, no, I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to keep knocking. I'm going to keep blowing this horn, my car horn. I will not let you sleep until I have what I need. Listen to this. Let's keep reading. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, or as the New King James says, his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. I just want to get some rest. Let's get the guy out of here. And Jesus goes on to say and says, I say unto you, ask, it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask a bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Jesus just is asking a lot of practical questions here. But notice what he says in verse 13. Wow, this ought to excite us, brothers and sisters. If ye then, being evil, or not being God, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are simply not asking, according to Luke 11. This is not a casual asking. This is not if we have time. This is not, well, we'll see how it goes this evening and if I can fit it into my schedule. This is not that kind of asking. This is a desperate asking that I risk being made a fool with by my friend's eyes because I'm kneeling outside. I will not leave at this ungodly hour until he gives me what he needs. Brothers and sisters, I'm sorry to say, but so often in my heart and my life, I don't know what that kind of spiritual hunger is because so many of my physical needs are met. And our physical needs, we have so much food, so much clothes, so many other responsibilities that it deadens our spiritual appetites. And then we wonder, why isn't this working? Luke 11 makes it very clear. Just ask. But it's a continual, persistent asking that says, I will not leave until it happens. And somehow, Brothers and sisters, God knows when you and I get to that point. 
If you go on to read, we won't take the time to read it here, but in verses 14 to 26, Jesus is articulating that a house divided against itself will not stand because they're accusing him of, of uh, throat, casting out demons through the name of Beelzebub. And Jesus is simply saying, there's no way that if I'm Beelzebub that I can cast out somebody that belongs to me in my kingdom. It doesn't work. Any house that is divided will not stand. So here, if you're asking for the Holy Spirit to come, and you want him to come, but in your heart, your affections and your loyalties are divided, a divided house, the Holy Spirit can not come. The stronger man needs to be subjected. You and I do not have what it takes to be stronger than the enemy. If we don't open ourselves up to allow the God of heaven to pour out the Holy Spirit into our cup that is now empty, and we don't allow that transformation to take place, the spirits will see that our cup is empty, and they will go out and find some other spirits and come into this clean place where the presence of God might be there in, in the fact that the room got cleaned up and maybe the sin is all gone, but the very life of that person isn't filled with the Spirit of God yet. And Jesus simply says, if this is your life, if this is your heart, you will come to destruction. The Holy Spirit, He will come. He wants to come. But He needs a clean vessel. And then He's just asking you to, in faith, in persistent faith, come, fill me. I want you. I need you. The call that you have given my life, the call that you have given us as a church here, cannot be filled without the filling of the Holy Spirit. There's no way that I can ha take the time to uh, talk about, it, you know, is this a second work of grace or how much should you look for the filling of the Spirit and how all that is. There's a lot of controversy out there around this. I really don't think as God's people that we should spend a whole lot of time on some of those particulars. We know that it is God's heart, that we're all filled with the Holy Spirit, that we walk in the Spirit, that we're anointed with the Spirit, that we love in the Spirit, and that is enough. Figuring out precisely how it all happens and doesn't happen and who all does what in the Trinity, I I'm not sure about all that, but God, brothers and sisters, wants you to be full of Him through the Holy Spirit that He gave you. And through His Holy Spirit, you can have this joy-filled experience and have the witness in your heart that you are a child of God. And this thing of going to the neighbors and being ashamed to tell what God did for you down at Dollar General or at the workplace and for your moms that are at home and you just get exasperated with the daily cares of trying to care for your children, the Holy Spirit is there for you. It's incredible that God has opened up all of heaven's resources for us to live the way that he's asked us to live. And here's what's so amazing. If the Holy Spirit is full of us and has our hearts full, we find it a joy, we find it a blessing, and there's something within us that is propelling us to pursue God and everything that he has for us. It takes it from a have to to a get to. Stand with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the amazing provision of the Holy Spirit. Oh Lord Jesus, we just pray as your people that we would not be afraid of the Holy Spirit, but we would embrace the Holy Spirit, love the Holy Spirit, and look for his filling. Look for his guidance and his direction. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, to be our paraclete, to walk with us, to teach us, to show us, and to tell us what your heart is and how to live an overcoming, joy-filled Christian life. Oh, Lord Jesus, I just pray, if there's anybody here this morning that is hungry for more of this and doesn't understand what this is, that they would seek outside your door with persistence and refuse to go away until their need is met. 
Oh, Lord, just give us a hunger like this to be filled with the Spirit of God. Thank you so much for the brothers here. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house and opening up our hearts. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for ministering to us in the beautiful ways that you do. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.